Well, hello, this is Adam, and welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Today, I'm super excited to bring to you an ultra, ultra, ultra rare automobile. This 1971 AMC Ambassador Brome, thankfully it's a Brome, not just the base or the SST, but it's the Brome four-door sedan. I don't even know when the last time was that I saw one of these for sale. And this is pretty close to the end of the line for the Ambassador, a nameplate that predates the founding of American Motors itself. 1974 was the last year, kind of a one-year only style. 71s, 2s, and 3s look pretty similar, but they have some styling differences. 71 is my favorite of this body style. And I found this in Canada, in Toronto, at Old Is New is the name of the dealership, oldisnew.ca and Mike, the dealer principal, was kind enough to deliver it to me, bring it across the border, you know, etc. So here it is, and I couldn't be happier. Like I said, this is, I don't even remember the last time I saw one of these cars in person, much less for sale, and this car's in phenomenal original condition, original paint, original interior, just like I like to buy them, no rust, super clean. Does that mean that it's perfect? No means that there are some little things. You know, the paint's got some modeling in different areas and there's a few little pecks and things like that, but actually really not much to speak of. I don't even think there's a door ding on either side, amazingly. So this car was well loved. And I saw it for sale in Craigslist on Canada and it caught my eye because it was a brome. It had no vinyl roof. The vinyl roof was an option. You almost always see them with the vinyl roof. And I think it's not the best execution of a vinyl roof. So I love the fact that this had no vinyl roof. It was super clean. I love this. This is called Golden Lime is the name of the color with the black interior. And I just thought it was so 70s, so period correct. And the car was in such excellent shape. Also, it's pretty well optioned for an AMC. There's no power windows on these, you know, but it does have power steering, power brakes, air conditioning, AM radio. Uh, and it has the Brome interior, 364 barrel under hood. You could get the 304 was standard, the 362 barrel was optional, 364 barrel, and then the 401. I, you know, I would love if it had the 401, but I'm never going to find one. I don't even think I've seen one for sale with the 401, maybe in the last 20 years. So you can't go down to your local AMC dealer and order these anymore. This one I just thought was a perfect one that I couldn't pass up. And as I mentioned, the Ambassador was the top of the line for AMC. It's on a 122 inch wheelbase. This was really their luxury liner, or some people call it the Kenosha Cadillac because these are built in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I don't know if this is a Kenosha car or if this is a Brampton car. I have to look that up, but they were, you know, those were two major AMC facilities. And this was from a time when AMC was doing okay but not great. They had the ad campaign, what would you do if you had to compete with GM, Ford, and Chrysler? And I gotta be honest, this car, in spite of being a parts bin car, and it really is a parts bin car on a number of things. It's got a Ford stall starter, a Ford carburetor. Uh, it has a GM Saginaw steering column, GM Saginaw steering gear, GM ignition system, including the coil. Later they would go on the electronic ones to the motorcraft setup. Uh, this has a Borg Warner automatic in it, not the Chrysler Torque Flight, which they would use, I think, starting in the 1972 model year. It is AMC's own V8. The 360 was AMC specific. It's an excellent engine. AMC really made some great engines. Their V8s, their six cylinders, even their four cylinder that they came out with was great. But AMC was going through a pretty tough time during this time period. They were doing okay, but then they acquired, the amazing thing that caused them all this hardship was that they acquired Jeep in 1970. I think they paid around $70 million for it. And they acquired it kind of just at this time when fuel prices were spiking and they took on a lot of debt to fund it. And it's amazing because the thing that was the crown jewel of American Motors, that was the sole reason why Chrysler wanted them in 1988, I believe Chrysler bought them, really was the thing that almost dragged them under. They took on all this debt as a company. Then you have the OPEC embargo hitting. They were really betting big on Jeep and Jeep was struggling in the 70s. That was not the time, during the time of high fuel prices and inflation, that you wanted to buy Jeep. And it really just doomed the company. It took out and sucked 
all the life out of their finances. That coupled with the Matador Coupe that came out in 1974 that was a flop. The Pacer came out in 75, and in the first year it sold pretty well. But after the early adopters got their Pacer, it really died off again. I think also customers didn't have great experience with the dealer bodies from AMC. They were very old fashioned, high pressure, not great, you know, uh, dealer network. And the quality of the cars really started to decline too. So it, this is really kind of the last of the halcyon days of AMC. And I have to say, this car, shockingly, I can't believe how good the body fits are on it. They're almost beyond reproach for a 1970s era car. You know, even today, by today's standards, they're not horrible on most of the body panels. So they did put care into this car. My 82 AMC Eagle, I would say, is the antithesis of that. It's thrown together. I love the car, but it's thrown together. And I have to say, again, for a parts bin car, a car that's really a stretched Matador wheelbase, which stretched all up here in the front, so the passenger compartment is really no larger. It's, if I had gotten in one of these vehicles and test driven it in 1971, I would have bought a coupe. I probably would have bought it over the other stuff. It drives so well. The engine is so responsive. The suspension is nice and firm, but also you know not intrusive at the same time. The air conditioning is super cold. The seat comfort is great. The ride quality is, again, and the ride and handling balance on this car is really good. It handles really well for the time. And the ride is a bit stiffer, certainly than the Fords, but you know, I, I think it's, it's just great. And you can recline the seats all the way back, you know, just like the old Nash days. I mean, this car was really a compelling value proposition, and it retailed for just under $4,000 in the Brome trim. It's about the same price as a Caprice. It wasn't cheap, but it is a homely looking car, I will say. This front end, uh, Dick Teague was the, the AMC's VP of styling at the time, who previously worked for Packard. And some say that this front end is an homage to his time at Packard. Maybe yes, maybe no. I think it's kind of a funny looking car, but funny looking in a charming way. Like you almost drive and see it, but drive by it and see it, and it puts a smile on your face. Something about it, it's just a little too narrow. It needs, you know, if this were a GM or Ford car, it'd be a bit wider. It needs to come down and height a little bit. And then it would, you know, maybe be a bit better proportioned. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's just a phenomenally interesting car. I've never owned an Ambassador before. I've owned a number of AMC's, Concords, Eagles, kind of the latter part of AMC's life. And I'm just thrilled, thrilled to own this. And let's take the camera off and you can experience it a little bit more. All right, so let's do the walk around on one of these last fall days before the salt hits the road and the snow flies. Again, the 71 AMC Ambassador. They made about 10,000 of these from what I can discern in 1971. I don't think hardly any are left, especially without the vinyl roofs and in brome trim, which was the top trim. They had kind of the base, the SST, and then the brome. And it's one of those cars, it's a, it's a funny looking car, but I really, something about it is just charming. The way this belt line sweeps up like this and this kind of 71 LTD-esque rear this does have, I think they're dealer installed, well, I don't know what you call those, vent protectors or shades over the windows. I think they look kind of cool, so I'll leave them. All the chrome in this car is just perfect. There's not even a pit in this. I, I don't know where this thing was hermetically sealed, but it certainly was well loved and well taken care of. And the amazing thing is the Ambassador, like I said, it was on a stretch wheelbase, 122 inch wheelbase, bigger than the Matadors, but the passenger compartment is really the same, but you don't miss, I mean, this car feels so open and airy. The dashboard is very far forward. So look at how much space you have between the bottom of the seat bolster and the dash. I mean, it just gives you the sense of this open, airy cockpit. And the seats are very comfortable. Watch my video on the strange features and quirks of this, and you can see these seats recline all the way back very early reclining. You move this lever back and forth, and it kind of ratchets it back. These seats are also all the way back. I'm six feet one. It's almost too far back. 
They have great leg room in the front. And look at, in the rear, I've got tons of leg room as well still. They do have this funny, cheap, fiberglassy, cardboardy headliner that was in all the AMCs, really, aside from the mouse for a headliner in the later ones. And it works fine, but it's, you know, AMC was a pioneer in some of these cost-cutting moves, which is why I love them as a finance guy. It's same headliner color for any car, something that would later come to modern cars near you. And on Pacers, I believe the Pacer was the first car with factory blackout window trim here, so they didn't have to finish the underside of the interior. And yeah, I don't think anybody noticed, and they saved some money. The doors even closed great on this AMC. I do like the rear end treatment. It looks like it needs about three or four more inches in width. Very upright backlight, open and airy cabin. Let's take a look on the driver's side. Oh, that key buzzer. There we go. They did all have this kind of large wheel, which was shared with the non-power steering cars, which some people find offensive. I don't, I don't mind it, it's just fine. Full complement of gauges. Got a temp gauge, fuel gauge, speedometer, no tachometer, no voltmeter, but at least you get a temp gauge. Has the vertically oriented radio, just like the C2 Corvettes, the 63 split window, etc. And goofy, goofy HVAC controls, which I explain more in my Strange Qu Features and Quirks video. But it works. I love the desert only setting here too, which locks the compressor on and prevents it from shutting off. You don't want to use that in normal climates because the evaporator might freeze over. But again, really airy. I've got a vacuum out here. been enjoying it and driving the car. Open, airy cabin. Very comfortable seats. Well sprung. I mean, look at even on the inside of the doors on this car. This car is so clean. Let's take a look at the trunk. And a very stiff torsional spring on either side there. Not the typical torsion bar, but there's a little torsional spring on either side that lifts the trunk. And yes, this car has a number of trophies from the American Motors Owners Association. Best Ambassador, 1992, AMO International. Wow, okay. So it's been a trophy collector for some time. All the original paperwork, receipts about the car, work done to it. This, I think, was the original AC compressor that failed, so somebody's put a new one on it. Same style, the York 2 piston. Good compressors. Look at the bottoms of the doors, even, on this car. The door latches. So clean. The sill panel, so clean. Good God. Probably the cleanest, oh, one of the cleanest, for sure, 70s era cars that I own. Let's see if I can get the hood open here. And there's the 360 cubic inch V8. Again, you could get the 360. The 304 was standard. Air conditioning was standard on this car. Might have been the first car to have standard air conditioning. But this is one down from the top. The 401 was the top dog. And you'll notice in the motor compartment here, these AMCs all have the same width motor compartment they had really one platform, so whether you got a small car, a big car, it all was able to run down the same assembly line, all really on the same platform. They just put, I guess the AMC folks call these fender troughs, to <laughs> that extend the motor compartment out to the fender. And on some cars, like the Matador Coupes, these are humorously wide. They're pretty wide on this car, but I think the Matador Coupes are even larger. Genius, again, cost savings ideas. Sorry, I love that as a finance guy. But like I said, GM, ignition system, even says Delco Remy on the coil, Rochester products, evaporative canister, Ford Motorcraft carburetor. Uh, I think this is a Motorola alternator. I might have misspoken the other video, but you can see the Motorola products, 
um, voltage regulator, I believe there. Ford style starting relay, although it is different, not interchangeable. Saginaw steering gear, Borg Warner transmission, GM master cylinder, I believe. I mean, who cares? It runs great. Genius. Let's start it up. When I got this car, the seller said it ran lean and you kind of had to wait for it to warm up a little bit and then it ran great. Well, the choke was missing a clip on the rod. That was it. Now the choke works and it starts. Fires right up. Perfectly silent. Single exhaust. And somebody's put a chrome tip on here. I might take that off at some point, but at least it gets the exhaust away from the rear valence panel. Like I said, not even a door ding on this car, I don't think. In any case, let's go take it for a ride. All right, so here we are in the AMC. I gotta tell you, I just love the way this car drives. It's not an overly stiff suspension, but it is stiff for the time period. It's kind of like a Chrysler, in spite of this having four coil suspension and Chrysler had the torsion bar leaf set up in the rear. And this car just handles so well. This 360 V8 is extremely responsive. I mean, really responsive. Great torque. The steering gear is pretty quick. The seats are comfortable. It's a windy day here, and you do get a little more wind noise in this car than the Fords or the GMs of the era, but it's not offensive at all. The side glass in this car is actually pretty thick. I was shocked for AMC standards. I mean, this is thick door glass. So they were trying hard to make this a premium car. In spite of the fact that you do have to manually operate all the HVAC controls yourself and close off these upper vents when you want it to come out just on the heat. Close those off. You can close this one off, close that one off, and then the <laughs> remaining air is just forced out the only vents that are left, which are the heater vents. It works just fine though. I really wouldn't have minded it if I were a buyer back in 1971, because the rest of this car is just great. Again, the handling as I go back and forth here doesn't lean at all. You know, we're going 50 miles an hour. Super comfortable ride. And you know, the other thing about this car is the cabin just feels so open and airy. Lots of glass area, big windshield, big side glass. It just is a very comfortable car that puts a smile on your face. And again, this 360 V8 is really responsive to throttle tip in. AMC must have done something to this Motorcraft carburetor because it's far more responsive than it was on the Fords. So if you're able to find one of these in nice shape, I really have to recommend them. This is just a fun car. It's kind of funny looking, but it drives great. Puts a smile on your face. It's just a ton of fun. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, take care.